this is a man with a problem, or actually a lot of little problems and one big one. He's Scott Kirby and he's CEO of United Airlines. He has placed himself prominently at the leading edge of something the entire aviation industry hopes will just go away, but which will in fact become an ever more visible bit of business. It's the impact of aviation on global climate change. We'll get back to Mr. Kirby in a minute, but first a little outlining of the problem. It's one of both fact and perception. First, the perception. From up here in the cheap seats where general aviation lives, we t well, <laughs> I guess I'll walk that back. If you own an airplane, you're probably not thinking anything about it is cheap. I get that. But all things are relative and compared to a 787, even a new Cirrus is cheap. Now, where was I going with this? Oh yeah, from the general aviation perspective, we haven't exactly been big believers that anthropogenic climate change is a real thing. In this recent poll of AvWeb readers, a plurality thought the whole thing was a hoax. Although an equal number thought it was real but didn't know what to do about it, or that electric airplanes would help reduce emissions. Now some facts, such as it's possible to know them. The data varies, but the popular wisdom is that aviation contributes between 2 and 3 percent of global carbon emissions. This chart has it at under 2 percent. Really? Just 2 percent? That ain't squat, right? Meets my definition of squat. And that's why people who check this box on the poll, our carbon emissions are too small, have a point. Consider this. If this basketball represents the yearly volume of gasoline burned by cars in the U.S., this marble represents the aviation gasoline we burn. This shot put is the jet fuel. <laughs> yeah, I know a shot put's weird, but it's the only thing close to the right size, and it's actually a little small. After decades of yearly growth with up and down spikes, automotive gasoline consumption in the U.S. is flat, probably depressed by more economical cars and by electric vehicles. But avgas demand has been in slow decline since the 1980s. That's a bad thing if you're trying to promote aviation, but a good thing if you're worried about greenhouse gas emissions, because less fuel burned is less carbon dioxide emitted. So if your socially responsible friends grind you about being a carbon Bigfoot because you're burning 17 gallons an hour in your Cessna 210, show them this graph and tell them, hey, we're working on it. If you're socially responsible yourself and you're a pilot, well, you have a conundrum. We report from time to time on electric airplanes and maybe someday they'll have the same impact on avgas demand that electric cars have on auto gas demand. Don't hold your breath. We have reported ad nauseum on how battery limitations for small electric aircraft stunt the possibilities, but the pace of battery improvement is actually slowing. Aircraft hybrids are gaining notice, but no market traction because none of them are certified. This one, the EcoPulse from a consortium of Safran, Dyer, and Airbus, was recently unveiled in the flesh in Europe. Cool enough, I guess, but why would you want a hybrid anyway? Fair question. Would you be willing to carry less and go slower for the sake of emissions and sustainability? Well, some buyers might, but the sensible sales pitch, at least initially, is lower operating costs over hydrocarbon-powered airplanes. That's the idea behind this airplane, the Eco Caravan. The company building it, called Ampere, has replaced the PT6 turbine in the stock airplane with an innovative parallel hybrid drive powered by a 550 horsepower V12 red diesel engine. PT6 in the Grand Caravan has 850 horsepower. The diesel has 300 less, and that would tank takeoff and climb performance in a caravan. So to make it up, Ampere uses electric motors in parallel to the diesel, powered by batteries in a belly pod. Think of it as a kind of a power booster setup. The diesel handles cruise flight and can charge the batteries, but the airplane is also a plug-in for charging. If this sounds like a complex lash-up, well, it probably is. 
So what's the benefit? It's thermal efficiency. The PT6 runs at a brake-specific fuel consumption north of 0.50 pounds of fuel per horsepower hour. The red diesel at 0.35. In the world of efficiency, that's a pretty big difference. And Ampere claims it will reduce overall operating costs by 25 to 40 percent. That sounds good, but there's no free lunch. The hybrid version of the caravan gives up 1,200 pounds of payload to the PT6 version. Operators of such a hybrid will have to put a sharp pencil on the spreadsheet to see if they can make it work. Lower emissions might or might not sweeten the deal. And pilots who have flown turbines usually aren't burning with desire to go back to piston engines. Otherwise, in the world of small airplanes, electrics like the Pipistrel Velis, the proposed Bi Aerospace E Flyer 2, and Diamond's Electrified DA 40 are best thought of as early adopter airplanes. Here's one reason. The University of North Dakota recently did a study of its own flight activities and found that only about 11% of flights were an hour or less. An hour or less is the typical realistic endurance of current small electric airplanes. So if I'm a school, I'm going to buy an electric airplane I can only use for 11% of flights? Not too likely. It gets better with an hour and a half of endurance where Diamond hopes to be with its electric DA-40 and better yet with three hours where Bi Aerospace claims they will be with the E-Flyer. But they're not there yet. Yes, some flight schools are pushing electric airplanes in a mix with gasoline-powered aircraft for cross-country requirements. And yes, they're making it work with significant compromises. But if we're trying to shrink the emissions marble, it will probably shrink faster on its own due to declining gasoline demand. So auto gas consumption is flat, at least in the U.S. Avgas use is declining, so that leaves the shot put of Jet A. And therein lies the sticky problem. Here's the projected demand for airline travel. It's a robust growth industry, and the airlines are fully aware that as the rest of the economy decarbonizes, to use the popular term of art, airline aviation will become a larger share of CO2 emissions, possibly as much as 25%. The airlines and Boeing, Airbus, GE, Rolls-Royce, Pratt & Whitney, and a gazillion related industries realized this years ago, and as early as 2008, this popped out of the ground. Sustainable aviation fuel, otherwise known as SAF. In our news pages, I'm sure you've seen reports about small electric airliners supposedly entering service in a couple of years. But however promising these appear to be, their use cases will be too few to make a dent in jet fuel consumption, and that means the industry is betting big on SAF. Now back to Mr. Kirby. He has positioned United Airlines to be a leader in sustainable aviation fuel. He has committed $100 million to the project and has enlisted other companies to chip in capital too. Now that sounds like a lot of money until you push around the numbers and discover that SAF will require multiple billions in investment to produce enough jet fuel for the airlines to have a prayer of reaching net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And for our purposes, net zero means emitting as much carbon dioxide as is removed from the atmosphere by other means. So how's this supposed to work exactly? First, I'm sure you know that Jet A is nothing but refined kerosene that comes from about the middle of the crude oil distillation stack. Depending on the refinery cut, you get about four gallons of Jet A out of a 42 gallon barrel of oil. Like all hydrocarbons, Jet A consists of carbon rings with hydrogen molecules attached. This chemistry of sort of like Lego sets. Lots of ways to assemble the molecules from various sources to get the same product. Just depends on what your source materials, feedstock, happen to be and how much money you're willing to spend. To a jet engine, SAF looks like Jet A because the carbon and hydrogen pieces have been assembled just for that purpose. And when SAF is burned in a jet engine, it emits about the same amount of carbon dioxide and other pollutants as Jet A does, with one exception. 
A NASA study found that biofuels produce less soot than Jet-A does, and that helps reduce contrails. Those wispy exhaust clouds have been implicated as climate change accelerators, and that's one reason aviation emissions punch above their weight as a climate change factor. So just how much less carbon intensive SAF actually is depends on whose numbers you wish to believe. But the usual gouge is that 50 to 80 percent less carbon is emitted by burning SAF. The wide range has to do with what feedstocks are available and what processes are used. And this is where it gets, well, really kind of complicated. The basic idea is that biomass, plants mainly, but biomass derived stuff, is used for the feedstock. When the plants grow, they absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and that CO2 removal is how SAF gets credited for lower carbon emissions. Petroleum pumped out of the ground, on the other hand, just adds carbon dioxide that was never there in the first place. On the other, other hand, Jet-A made from oil is a lot cheaper than SAF made from soybeans. Right now, SAF is about four times more expensive than conventional Jet-A. Although as SAF production ramps up, economies of scale are supposed to make it cheaper. Looks good on paper, but getting to that point is going to be a heavy lift, and there are real questions if there's enough biomass to even get close, not to mention land to grow it and water to process it. For the past 20 years at least, researchers have been figuring out how to make jet fuel out of just about anything, including, and probably, thin air. There are currently six realistic paths to make SAF from biomass of various kinds. This one, Fischer Tropes, was used by Germany in World War II to make gasoline from coal, but it's flexible enough to make SAF from forestry residue and grass, even though that doesn't mean it's profitable to do that. By the way, SAF is blend limited to 50%, meaning it has to be mixed evenly with conventional Jet A. That's because aviation certification is conservative and the industry wants a track record before sending airliners out over the storm-tossed Pacific burning reprocessed cooking oil. And speaking of which, used cooking oil, or yellow grease as they call it in the world of fat processing, is in such high demand that in some markets its price is actually higher than virgin cooking oil made from soybeans or sunflowers. And just as happened with corn prices, when ethanol production soared, soybean prices are also rising. That pressure is coming not from sap production, at least not yet, but from biodiesel refining, which uses similar processes. In 2022, sap production tripled to 79 million gallons. Sounds like a lot, right? But it's barely a rounding area for what will eventually be needed. It amounts to a tenth of a percent of total jet fuel usage less if you project growth. And despite the rosy claims, delivering the SAF volumes required is a big if bordering on good luck with that. Another airline executive, Qatar Airways' Akbar al Bakr, pissed off the International Air Transport Association by calling SAF and Net Zero a PR exercise. He was too politic to call it greenwashing. And even though Qatar is a petro state, the airline is still investing in SAF because, well, the PR matters. The airlines simply aren't in a position to say that anthropogenic global warming is a hoax, and they're worried about this, carbon taxes or regulations that will sharply limit growth. And that's already going on in Europe, and the very customers the airlines hope will fuel their growth may be perfectly okay with that, and they might be okay with flying less, too. Some in the industry think that limited growth may be inevitable. A study by Bain and company predicted that despite increasing production, SAF prices will remain two to four times higher than historic Jet A prices. As a result, airline operating costs could be higher by 8 to 18 percent. Bain's study also predicts that by 2050, that's 27 years from now, hydrogen and electric aviation technology will mature only to the point that it will reduce aviation emissions by a paltry 5%. And that takes us full circle back to small electric aircraft. Are we already at the why bother point with these things? 
Arguing that they will contribute to sustainability is to ignore convincing data to the contrary. Even if they achieve a 30% market share in 10 years, a wildly optimistic assumption, the emissions reductions are just too small to make any difference, much less a measurable one. If an argument can be made for small electric airplanes, and maybe it can, it's their potential for lower operating costs. This technology isn't static. It will advance and improved endurance will better position it on UND's practicality graph. You can sort of see a faint outlines of a winner in what Diamond is doing. The company's diesel-powered DA40 trainers already burn less fuel than gasoline versions, and they're working on approving those engines to burn SAF. Pair that with an electric airplane with a true hour and a half of endurance, and maybe flight schools will bite. Sustainable aviation fuel is the wild card here. Yes, it's gaining traction, but it has a long way to go to be a realistic force in the market, and despite claims that scaling it up will bring the price down, there simply may not be enough feedstock to make that work. It is, however, finding its way into the general aviation market at a handful of airports. At some of these, it's priced close to Jet A, but mostly it's two or three bucks a gallon higher. And that pricing may reflect the $1.25 per gallon blender tax credit the government is offering to companies to prime the SAF production pump. That government largesse is supposed to be temporary, but probably won't be. For the past 18 years, the ethanol industry has enjoyed a similar subsidy and probably will until the end of time or until the planet becomes a black cinder. So, obvious question. Is there any reason for a turbine flying GA pilot to spend two or three bucks a gallon more to buy SAF? Maybe it's a nice virtue signaling, but seriously, at this stage, you're not exactly saving the planet. Actually, what you're probably doing is making investment in expanding the SAF industry against the day when either carbon taxes or direct regulation will require its use. The summer of 2023 has proven to be a weather catastrophe shit show that shows no signs of abating. Much of the reporting ties these events to a rapidly warming planet. Go ahead and argue among yourselves about whether this is caused by human CO2 emissions or is just volcanoes and swamps. But eventually some kind of serious regulation or taxation is almost certain to happen. As I said, it's already beginning in Europe. The airlines would like to get in front of that by demonstrating reduced emissions. SAF may fall far short of doing that, but right now it's the only game in town. For AdWeb, I'm Paul Bertarelli. Thanks for watching.